Thank you, Mike, for that great introduction. And thank you all for coming. I want to talk to you today about the psychology of lens selection. I'm really talking about how I've evolved as a photographer. If you've ever seen me on stage, you've seen me say, I'm a 35-85 girl, meaning I like to have a 35 millimeter on one hip and an 85 millimeter on the other hip. And I don't need anything else ever, or so I thought. <laughs> So now things are starting to change, and since things are starting to change, I tried to look back at how I started and how things got to where they are now. Before we get all the way into this, if you haven't seen me on stage just being thrilled about prime lenses, my name's Charmy Pena. I'm a wedding photographer. I'm based out of Princeton, New Jersey. I shoot mostly multi-day Indian weddings. It's not exclusively what I shoot, as you're gonna find out, but it is most of what I shoot. So right before we get into it, I wanna share a slideshow with you of my favorite work from this year, from last year. So we're going to see a couple of my early images, and I hope that you won't judge them as much as I judge them. But I will be up here judging them a little bit. <laughs> this image is from my very first wedding uh, in 2006. I had been following around my wedding photographer, who very generously offered to let me carry her bags and see how she shot weddings. I was offered the chance to shoot at her weddings, and I was too nervous to make it happen for six months. For six months, she would say, here's a camera, you should shoot, and I just couldn't do it. But when it was time to shoot my own wedding, obviously, I thought, I've been watching Marie shoot with a 24 to 70 on one hip and a 70 to 200 on the other. That's what makes sense. I'm going to rent, because no, I didn't have any money, I'm uh, going to rent this gear, and that is how I'm going to shoot the wedding. My logic was, between a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200, I have everything I need. I have 24, I have 200, and I have everything in between. The problem with that thinking is that I was really only thinking about logistics at my first wedding. Am I shooting everything super wide and super tight? I wasn't necessarily thinking about the content. I wasn't thinking about connection or light or composition. Don't get me wrong, these clients were happy with their photos and they got beautiful photos. But I wasn't thinking of it in that way. I was just shooting what I thought looked pretty, which, which works, but it only takes you so far. My need to shoot wide and tight and nothing else is never more apparent than in another wedding from my very first year, where I took this with uh, the 70 to 200, and it does have emotion, and I do love this photo. But soon after, I felt like, oh my god, I got a wide shot. I mean, I got a tight shot, and I got so many tight shots, and I didn't get any wide shots yet, so I have to take a wide one. So I went and took a wide shot. Uh, what you need to know about this is that in my need to get a tight shot and a wide shot and not really think about my content, this parking lot, they're on a boat. You, know, wanna, you wanna know what's on the other side of the boat? Water. Why didn't I shoot the water? It just wasn't something I was thinking about. I wasn't thinking about content. I just wanted to make sure that the client had every option. I had a wide shot, a medium shot, a tight shot. They just, they had to have everything. So then I took a workshop 
with someone I love. His name is Paul Giraud. He's a newspaper guy. And when I took this workshop, he looked at my work and he's like, you know, you could benefit from using just a 35 and an 85. And I was like, okay, crazy man. Great idea, not gonna do it. <laughs> and then he didn't give me a choice. He got me an assignment while I was at the workshop shooting a family in their home and gave me his 35 and 85 and sent me there for two hours and said, make beautiful work. I'll see you in two hours when I pick you up. <laughs> so I had no choice. I only had my 35 and I had my 85. And suddenly I had to think about where I was positioning myself. I remember shooting, I wish I had these photos to show you, but they were from like 2009 and I don't know where they are. <laughs> but I remember shooting this child doing his homework in a long, narrow hallway. And the 85 was clearly not an option. I didn't have a 24 to 70 to play with where in the 24 to 70 range would make sense. I had a 35. I had to think about my placement. And I had to think about my timing. And something about being forced to use a single focal length made my mindset change. I started thinking about my positioning. And I became more patient. If you know me on a personal level, I'm not a very patient person. So getting to be patient in my creative space was a gift to me. So I went home and I started shooting weddings with a 35 and an 85. This is the first wedding I shot with a 35 and an 85. And while it wasn't perfect or up to my current 2020 standards, I started to see things completely differently. I knew where my positioning needed to be, and I started to pay attention to what was happening and not so much what focal length I might use. So after the very first wedding, I went home, I sold the 24 to 70, I sold the 7200, I got myself a 35 and an 85, and I only shot with the 35 and the 85. I will confess, I did have a new mindset problem, which was, I wouldn't let my second shooter shoot with anything but a 35 or an 85. If they showed up at a wedding with a 16 to 35, I was like, don't shoot with the 16 end of that. Because I thought that the only way to have a cohesive collection was to use the same focal lens. Now I know that that's not how that works. And really, your execution of any given lens, whether you're filling your frame, whether your lighting makes sense, and the connection in the frame, is really what makes something a part of a cohesive collection. But for now, 3585 became the thing that changed me into a better photographer. Being restricted to these two lenses made me think about light and connection in a completely different way. They became an extension of me instead of my gear. I never thought about my gear anymore. And so I spent the next many years <laughs> getting to know my 35 and my 85 super, super well. When I saw these trees in Cancun at this destination wedding, even before we were close, I knew that I was gonna put the couple in between the trees, make them lean towards me, be in the sand, and shoot up for a very clean frame with my 35. I knew it because even standing here now, I can tell you what my 85 frame would be and what my 35 frame would be because those focal lengths are burned into my memory. And I know that I can use that same 35 up close in a completely different way. Getting to know these lenses let me make them invisible. When I was shooting this engagement session, it started to rain. It wasn't supposed to rain. I check my app constantly before I go on an engagement session, but it was like a squall or something. And it came in fierce. Luckily, we were in the alcove of a little apartment building. And it was a couple years ago, I still was in a mindset where I didn't want my couples to think I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so I used to keep like emergency tricks in my bag. One of the emergency tricks I kept in my bag, by the way, it's still there, um, is this red twinkle light. It's battery powered. And so while we were stuck in this teeny tiny alcove, I already knew my 35 would work for me. So what I really focused on was how am I gonna make something creative and beautiful in this like five by five space? So I put a blue gel on the wall, I used my twinkle lights in front of my front element and I got them this. 
they use this for their wedding branding all the way throughout. So I think just letting my lens be invisible, this is with the 85, let me focus on the work. And each lens has something strange it can do. This is the 35. I was not 300 feet up in a tree. <laughs> I was standing on a bench right at the edge of where the bride is. My assistant was holding the back of my pants so I wouldn't fall and murder the bride before her wedding. And I shot nine frames with the 35, and then I stitched them together to make this. And I knew that the 35 could handle this without looking too wild. And that's why I was able to execute it. This is the Nikkor 85 1.8. People have a hard time believing that that is a natural flare, but that is a natural flare out of the 85 1.8. I know my lenses' quirks. I know the strange things they can do. I know their challenges, so I know how to overcome them. And that's natural. And the other thing that having these two lenses and letting them become a full part of who I am, how I shoot, and, and just an invisible part of how I work every day is that I started to focus on my connection with my clients. So when I'm shooting the Vidai at the end of the day and everyone's crying, I have my 35 and I'm super close. And because I haven't been thinking about my gear and I haven't been thinking about my kit, I haven't been thinking about any of that, I have instead spent my entire morning saying, hi, mom, hi, dad, hi, auntie. I'm your best friend now, sister. So when I get close and they're emotional, they don't even know I'm there. I think about how I can use terrible light and make it beautiful and quirky. How I can take care, um, wow. How I can take advantage of architectural spaces and make them look beautiful. And it, like I said, it has absolutely made me a more patient shooter. For this frame, I was standing up on stage. They were at a dance floor, sort of where the audience is. And my assistant was chasing them around with a stick and a speed light. And instead of trying to concoct the moment, I waited. I knew what my frame would be well before I stood up on the stage. And I waited and I waited until they turned around and I got this. So a couple from last year, because I still am shooting majority 35, 85. So this is the 85. When I was getting ready to shoot this wedding, I knew that I would have no time. This couple asked me to shoot their wedding. This photo ended up in um, People magazine, a lot of places. Um, it went a little bit viral. Uh, but when they asked me to shoot their wedding, I actually ended up delaying a flight with all my sisters. Um, we do an annual sisters trip. And I delayed my flight so that I could shoot it. But they knew I only had two hours. I knew I only had two hours and I had to make the best of what time I had. The other thing the 35 and the 85 have done for my mindset is they've made me really efficient. Because I don't think about my gear, I think about everything else. So immediately when I saw this architecture, and you're gonna see it again in another photo, I plotted two photos that I knew I had to have. And instead of thinking about my gear, I started getting the people I needed to throw the pedals and arrange for this to happen. And in a getting ready room, I'm 100% comfortable only having my 35 and 85, although you will see that I now have new options should I want them. And that patience has paid off in so many ways. The garlanding of the groom is usually the moment. That's the moment you're supposed to shoot. And she had just garlanded him. The patience also has made me keep my camera to my face even when I think I have the shot. I already have the shot, and there's this temptation, right, to look at the back of your camera. I want to know that I got it. Something about my gear becoming invisible, not only to my client, but also to me, has made it so that I don't have to do that anymore. And so I keep my camera to my face, and when big moments happen, I shoot through them, and I keep going, and I end up with something like this. For this, it's, a get, it's right after getting ready. I'm on a chair shooting down at the bride because I know what my 
minimum focusing distance is going to be. And so I know where I have to be to make this happen. I need my 85, I need to be on a chair, I need her to be down, and I know, I, I know what I can get. And when I get to the dance floor, I'm always using my 35. My dance floors are like little mini mosh pits. <laughs> They're 20 by 20 dance floors with 300 people on them. I have gone home with a black eye from a dance floor, but the 35 lets me get into the action and I just focus on the emotion. And the other place that the 35 is super convenient for me is the barat. The barat is like one big party where the groom is coming in and his family, he's on a horse here, but the horse is not part of the story. But that party, it's most fun for me to shoot it with the 35 because I get to get in and get close to everybody. With the 85, you're almost a, a viewer, but with the 35, you're a part of the party. And that's what I want it to feel like. The great thing about Indian weddings is that I am very, very welcome to be wherever I want to be, which means if I want to be on the stage, I am welcome to be on the stage. However, my mother taught me to have really good manners <laughs> And so I don't want to be obtrusive and I don't want to be in people's business and I definitely don't want to block you know, grandma or mom from seeing what's happening. But knowing my frame and knowing exactly what it's going to be lets me jump up there, get what I need and jump off because I'm not up there trying to figure out what's going to work. I already know. I know that here I need my 35. I'm going to get up there, I'm going to shoot it and I'm going to get off the stage. Again, that architecture that I said I took advantage of, this was the second shot that I immediately planned. This is a seven frame composite. I had one groom stand still, and I had the other groom stand out of frame and then started snapping as he walked through my frame. Then I picked seven frames that worked together and merged them uh, in Photoshop. The 35 serves me really, really well in the getting ready room. No matter how small it is, I can story tell with this lens. Like this Buddha side-eyeing this bride, I don't know why he's so mad at her, but I like it. And at Indian weddings, and this could be true for a lot of different cultural weddings, the guests are always out of their seat. They're always in the action. They always wanna also be taking photos. And so knowing what my focal length needs to be lets me kind of plant my feet and keep my space and not let people distract me from what needs to get done. And I started shooting a little bit of fashion and stuff outside of weddings this year, and I've carried my 35 and my 85 through even to that work. So this is with the 35, and I was shooting for um, a designer in Soho. And this is Cory Booker being mocked by a child. It was great. <laughs> uh, but my 35 in these very tight, when I was shooting for him, I was shooting these little meet and greet events that were really, really not spacious. Um, but my 35 served me well there too. So earlier this year, I had, um, well maybe two years now, I had an assistant bring a 105 1.4 to the wedding. He was like, you're gonna wanna try this. I promise you, you're gonna wanna try it. And I was like, I don't wanna try it. I'm good, I don't need it, I, I'm fine. I don't like carrying heavy bags. He was like, you make me carry your bags, try the lens. <laughs> so I tried the lens and I fell in love. And this is when the next evolution started. I don't need the 35 and the 85 only to focus on composition and light and connection. Now that my mindset has evolved to that place, I should be able to use any lens and execute the same way. And limiting myself to only the 35 and 85 may be hurting me sometimes because I'm not taking advantage of the beautiful quirks of other lenses. I shoot this lens wide open at 1.4 and I'm never displeased. It's magical. It lets me take advantage of the compression of long hallways. In the past, I never would have shot a bridal party at 1.4. I, know, that it, I would never have done this before, but I know this lens can handle it, and it's amazing. The compression of the foreground here, 
makes me happy because we were in a very busy place with a lot of people, but you can't tell. It still feels private and it feels intimate. And the 105 helped me bring in that privacy and that intimacy. This image was taken at the reception. She had gobos flying around and the gobos were casting light on the walls, but they weren't casting rainbows. But I saw it on my skin for a moment and knew that if you got close to the gobo, you had a rainbow. So I placed the bride, I put a little bit of video light on the left side of her face, and I waited for the rainbow to hit her eye. Uh, it took a few minutes, but this is also with the 105 wide open. Another lens I've recently fallen in love with is the 28 1.8. I was very, very averse, averse to super wide lenses, thinking that they just didn't fit my style, too wide. But if you fill your frame, nothing's too wide. So I was getting yelled at a lot when I took this image because the doorman at the Philadelphia Ritz-Carlton, where I think I've been banned, um, is not happy with you blocking the doors. <laughs> but that's the only place I could shoot from to arrange all these people. This is a 22 image composite where I had posed all of them, and then my assistant went through and lit each one, one at a time. I wanted really smooth lighting, but I wanted a really dramatic image, and one big softbox really wouldn't have cut it for the look that I wanted. So, you've heard me say I'm a prime girl, and I love primes, but I did say I was evolving, so you can't be too surprised that I have suddenly fallen in love with a 70 to 200. <laughs> Uh, earlier this month, Nikon sent me over a 70 to 200 for the new Z cameras, and its quirks are amazing. This was shot from a foot away from her hand because the minimum focal length on that lens at 70 is incredible. It doesn't actually make sense to me, but I don't have to understand the physics of it. I just have to know I love it. So for me, who has always taken a macro lens, I'm now rethinking my strategies because when I shoot a ring shot at a wedding, I don't really care if it's not two thirds of the frame. I generally want my ring shot to be kind of an environmental shot that shows off other things about the wedding. This was shot with the 70 to 200. That was shot with the 70 to 200 from just a little bit away. So now I'm completely rethinking my getting ready room strategy and thinking like, do I need to take this 100 macro? Or is this going to serve me even better all day and I'll use the 100 macro for other purposes? On a wedding day, this might be my new winner. We'll see, I'll be here next year, I'll tell you all about it. So before I leave you, I wanna tell you about a mistake I made this year. And we're gonna talk about how you're never gonna make it, I'm never gonna make it again. <laughs> But the mistake actually brought a new lens into my gear kit that I love, and I'm gonna show you why. So I was packing for a wedding in New Zealand. I had a couple that was eloping in New Zealand and they were flying me from New Jersey to New Zealand to shoot their ceremony for an hour. As I was packing my gear kit, I just thought, they're flying me all the way to New Zealand. I should take everything. And then I realized that I'm not a take everything kind of girl, and so I cut it down. I was like, I only need my 35 and my 85, it's fine. In the process of removing my 35, I, uh, removing my 50, I removed my 35. So I got to New Zealand and I had a 50 and an 85 to shoot a wedding in a beautiful landscape. That's terrible. Luckily, um, there were a lot of people who jumped in to help me and somebody sent me a 24 and somebody sent me a 35. But that 24 got to me first. So I shot with the 24. And I now love the 24. <laughs> and I don't know what's happening to me because I used to be a 3585 girl, but these lenses are just too magical, too beautiful, too sharp for me not to have them in my kit. And all of these images still feel like me. Changing the lenses didn't change the result. This girl trekked through the rain and on a mountain muddy hike to get to her wedding. She's incredible. That's with the 85. And all of these are with the 24. Something I could never imagine using in the past, 
but something that served me really, really well during this wedding. And the last addition to my kit is really because of the Z cameras. Over the years, I have rented the 45 tilt shift 50 times. And then I don't use it and I send it back. Because on a wedding day, my responsibility is to the clients. I cannot play and I cannot have fun and I cannot learn things on their dime. I am there to work and so I need to just work. And then when I'm not at a wedding, I don't really want to play with the lens in a knot like this. The 45 tilt shift has a purpose and it's not in my living room. So I've never really given it a shot. But a second shooter friend of mine brought the 45 tilt shift to a wedding recently and I used it on the Z with the adapter and he pointed out that I no longer need to fuss with it because the very accurate EVF on the back of the Z tells me exactly what I'm gonna get. And so I brought it to New Zealand with me so that I could play because I wasn't gonna waste time. The Z was gonna tell me everything I needed to know about how this was gonna execute images. And this is the client's favorite image from their entire ceremony. So now I went from being a 24 to 70 and a 7200 girl to a 35, 85 girl to thinking of lenses as just one more extension of me. So getting to know all the quirks and all the challenges and all the positives of every single lens that is available to me is letting me decide when I should use them, when I shouldn't use them, and when I should leave them at home. But put stickers on the back of your lenses so that you don't do what I did. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Charmy Pena. Awesome program. All right, guys.